Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this session. Um, we are discussing today mental health, hidden security risk, very crucial topic within the context of this MARSEC conference. The focus for the next 30 minutes or so will be on the impact of the pandemic on mental health issues suffered by crews and importantly, also the issues facing the armed security teams sent to protect them. Um, we have 30 minutes or so of discussion and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Rispo Tallis, Professor at the University of Portsmouth and John Dolan of Standard Club Limited. Fantastic experience to share with you. How this session is going to work. First of all, Risto is going to give us a brief presentation, trying to condense a great deal of research into five to 10 minutes of comments. Then John is gonna give some comments from the Standard Club perspective on the issues at hand. We then are gonna to move to a general debate. We have some questions we want to be discussing um, and you are also invited, please, to put in your questions and join the debate. Any questions that we don't get round in this brief time to addressing, either Risto or John will be able to feedback later via the chat box function on the event platform. So uh, without further ado, of course, on the platform, you can also find details for Risto and John um, on their biographies and experience. So without further ado, I'm going to turn straight over to Risto to kick us off with the opening presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> I'm now going to attempt the impossible feat of an academic discussing in five, 10 minutes what is essentially two academic <laughs> studies. Before I begin, I just, uh, next slide please. Well, before I begin, I'm going to just contrast aviation and shipping. So this is a picture of flight radar, approximately 15,000 aircraft took to the skies on the 7th of March, 2020, which prior to the first lockdown. And then the second slide, please. So this is a month later and we've reduced by two thirds. And so the amount of aircraft flying has, has, has obviously impacted by the coronavirus crisis. And next slide, please. This was the picture yesterday of, this is marine traffic yesterday afternoon. And this is, if you take the picture from early March, February, it'll be pretty similar. So the amount of volume of shipping hasn't changed very much but obviously the aviation has. So next slide, please. I'm talking, talk, talk briefly about two recent studies. Um, I haven't referenced these in the standard Harvard APA way, but this is essentially, these are two studies. The first one's by Helen Sampson and Neil Ellis from the Seafarers International Research Center in Cardiff University. They published a study in 2019 on seafarers mental health and wellbeing. And I'm going to summarize uh, only some of their findings, um, as I don't have time to, to do their, their full presentation in the service. And then I'm going to summarize some of the findings that I did with my colleague, Professor Mark Button from University of Portsmouth and Dr. Mark Doyle from Solent University, where we looked at the mental health and well-being of security operatives in the UK, the largest study to date of mental health and well-being amongst the security sector, land-based. And next slide, please. So very briefly, the, some of the findings of the Cardiff study were that there's uh, evidence of um, increase in recent onset anxiety and depression among serving seafarers. Evidence that some role seafarers were particularly prone to emotional exhaustion and burnout. Maritime charities, p &I clubs and stakeholder organizations have identified mental health and wealth, well-being and welfare as an important issue. Findings of, of the study whether employers do not recognize the importance of mental health and welfare on board vessels to the same extent as the maritime charities and stakeholders do. Isolation, loneliness, lack of shore leave, fear of criminalization, fear of job loss, separation from family, all predispose seafarers to mental ill health. And the next slide, please. I found this 
in first finding on this slide really quite shocking. Of the employer respondents contacted in the research, 55% stated that in the last 10 years, their companies had not introduced any policies or practices aimed at addressing seafarers' mental health. Seafarers identified the provision of free internet access as the most significant contribution that could be made by employers to improve their mental health and well being on board. Companies and stakeholders should take steps to address the difference between the levels of happiness seafarers when they're on board, which is lower compared to when they're at home. Companies and stakeholders should be aware of the evidence indicating that recent onset psychological disorders are increasing among serving seafarers. A few years ago, I super co-supervised a PhD student at Solent University who was looking at the mental health of seafarers and some of whom had suffered piracy incidents and they had very much suffered psychological disorders as a result of those piracy incidents. And contracts should balance work and time, leave time for all ranks in a ratio of not worse than two to one with an upper limit of six months on board. And owing to COVID that's been breached many, many times over. These are only the results of only some of the findings from the study. Um, and I'll be leaving the full academic reference uh, in the chat later for people to, who want to access the, the Cardiff study. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is the, the study that I conducted with Mark Button and Mark Doyle. Um, we looked at, we had uh, questionnaire responses from 754 security operatives purely in the UK. And the questionnaire was based on a hybrid of three separate mental health and well-being surveys. The first one, the Warwick, Warwick Edinburgh Mental Health Wellbeing Scale, is, is largely about emotions. The second part of the questionnaire regarded the civilian checklist for post-traumatic stress disorder. And the third part was all about alcohol and drug misuse using the CAGE aid formula. Now, I don't have time to summarize all of them, but I've, uh, in the next slide, you'll see, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> this was the breakdown of the 754. Majority were security guards um, who also doubled up as uh, nighttime door supervisors to supplement their income. Others worked in close protection, cash and valuables and transit, public space surveillance, uh, key holding, and some didn't hold a security industry authority license. Majority were male, almost 85%, and 15% female in our study. And next slide, please. I'm just going to highlight verbal abuse and threats of violence. Obviously, you consider these are shore-based, land-based uh, security operatives. But it's quite disturbing to find that almost a quarter suffer verbal abuse every day, similarly once a week. Um, but the threats of violence is really quite, quite, uh, quite shocking as well. 10% suffered threats of violence every day, 15% once a week. So these are quite disturbing findings. And next slide, please. This is the one that we found really quite significant. So of those um, who worked in land-based security, Almost 20% were veterans who'd, suffered, who'd, work, who'd, who'd actually been in war zones, typically Iraq and Afghanistan. And also the number that had wit witnessed the situation in which someone was seriously injured or killed was 43%. Amongst a study of 754 security operatives, it's not entirely representative of the UK total number of security operatives, the number about 100,000, um, but it's still really quite um, a concern. And the next slide, please, talks about post-traumatic stress. The um, cutoff for PTSD diagnosis we set at 33, that is is basically the way that the respondents are answered the questions on the DSM-5 scale. Um, Murphy and others have recommended that 33 is a suitable cutoff point for a full diagnostic criteria of PTSD. 
The worrying thing is we found that 39.3% of our respondents showed full diagnostic PTSD, which is a very worrying development. Now, question is, if 20% of land-based security operatives are veterans, what is this percentage amongst um, privately contracted armed security personnel? And if 40% of land-based security operatives suffer from PTSD, what is this proportion amongst privately contracted armed security personnel on board vessels? These are important questions to which I don't have the answers yet. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Um, next slide, we'll just conclude that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, still muted. Um, Risto, for a yeah, disturbing presentation in terms of the statistics. We'll get back to talking a little bit more about those in our Q&A period. Um, but I'd like to turn the floor over to John. Um, Risto, you mentioned um, maritime charities and other stakeholders um, apparently being more engaged with mental health issues than the employers, something I'd like to talk about. But John, as one of those key stakeholders, can you share some of your perspectives on the mental health issues, both with the security personnel and seafarers, and also um, what changes, if any, you've seen um, as a result of COVID-19? Oh, John, you're muted. That's interesting because I'm going to make a reference to human frailties here and then I <laughs> unmute and then mute myself again. Proof positive, I would say. Um, well done, Risto. Most interesting uh, piece there and, and some very interesting points that I'm sure we'll talk more about. Just to put some context on, on the, the human element aspect of, of in, in shipping. Um, I, I'm going to date my where I first encountered this topic with Professor David Morby in my very early days of starting in this business back in the 70s when he wrote the human element in shipping book, which, which you know, that's probably 40, 45 years ago right now. So it's been around in, in even in its modern format for quite some time. This area of study then fed into our own uh, interest, close interest in the Standard P&I Club when we were involved in the uh, insurance and the claims management following the Herald of Free Enterprise, which gave rise to the ISM code and all of that. And that then fed into a publication that the Standard Club uh, collaborated with the Department of Transport in the UK, TK and BP, two big, big oil uh, companies on the human element again in shipping, a kind of a modern restatement of perhaps much of what David Morby wrote about. And then moving it forward, we've, we've constantly increased our role in this area and published widely on it. Um, we published in 2018 the Standard Bulletin, Safety Bulletin on uh, crew well-being, which then became a very timely publication when we see what's happened in 2020. So what I'm saying is that the human element in shipping has been a very, very uh, dear to our hearts in the standard PNI club. Um, the mental health being has grown out of that in the last, we'll say, 10, perhaps 15 years more significantly where we've published on it and now of course layer up all of the well-known anxieties caused by COVID-19 the issue has become even more sharply focused and then if you add a further layer of anxiety and stress caused by vessels having to enter and trade in areas of known piracy risk where people actually have suffered piracy attacks, then it just exacerbates what it was already a difficult situation. So right now, the whole of the shipping industry and p &I insurers are wrestling with this issue of COVID in all its facets, impinging upon the, the, the safe conduct of vessels today. Regarding your inquiry regarding the uh, impacts on the security personnel on board, I would say that I have very little experience in that particular that regard. I would defer to Risto on, on his insights there. But suffice to say that um, uh, security guards on board vessels who may have uh, traces or, or indeed be suffering from PTSD 
would be a major concern to anybody, whether it's a captain, the crew member, or indeed the owner, manager, insurers associated with that particular vessel. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so let's throw back and go to Risto at the close of your presentation uh, when you were presenting on your PTSD issue. Um, you mentioned, you know, the statistics. Um, so to come back to that, you know, how, to the best of your knowledge, you know, how prevalent is PTSD among seafarers um, and embarked armed security personnel? And if that data is lacking, what can be done to actually unearth that data through research? Well, <clears throat> we don't have the figures. This is why I would love to reach out to current and former members of uh, SCEG um, of, amongst the, the PMSCs for me to be able to repeat the research that we did with our land-based security operatives with the privately contracted armed security personnel. However, when we did our research with the security companies, some of the companies were very reluctant to engage with us because they didn't want to know about the scale of the problem. And I made myself very unpopular with some of them. Um, also, we over the summer, my colleagues in the University of Portsmouth, uh, three of my colleagues who are psychologists, we did a study of our higher education sector within the UK, not only University of Portsmouth, but other other university staff, teaching staff, um, are actually as academic and non-academic, within the UK um, as to their emotional well-being and mental health as a result of pre and post lockdown. And when we encountered executive directors of human resources, we reached a blank wall. They did not want to understand the scale of their problem. In the research we conducted with the security companies, um, some of the, the, the uh, vignettes, the stories we got back were for the security managers didn't understand PTSD, they didn't want to know about it. We had one example of a, of a security manager who said to a security operative who was back from, from uh, medical leave, he said, you got your happy pills now, now get back to work. There's, it's, it's an absolutely shocking situation. Um, I would like to reach out to the key security companies, the PMSCs, and let me repeat the, the research, because we all have a responsibility to help these people, many of whom are veterans who are silently suffering PTSD. One of the major issues that I think will be a problem for seafarers who finally get home, when they finally do, is that if they are suffering mental health issues, when they return to sea and they are in a similar situation which triggers them, which they may not be able to understand or avoid until it hits them, this is, is it will be a problem in the future, particularly if they have a serious res responsibility on the vessel in, in, in vessel operations. And I speak from experience. I had a near fatal car crash four years ago. Two years after my crash, uh, we just, my wife and I drove through a car wash and I uncontrollably was in floods of tears. And I couldn't stop them because there was a, my surgeon explained to me, there's a latent issue at the back of your mind, which will reduce over time. Now, these seafarers will come ashore. They won't know that they're going to have these, they will be facing these triggers. So much of the counseling that the shipping companies and the security companies need to provide to their operatives and their staff is training and, and, and an idea of how to avoid those triggers in the future. And that's through a large amount of counseling, which, which I think is, is, is required. Rather long-winded answer to your, to your question, Rachel. You're throwing down a gauntlet there to the community. Um, and unfortunately, um, the point you make regarding um, people not wanting to know, you know, is prevalent in other issues where people know other issues cybersecurity and other areas where people don't want to share information, but clearly we know there's big issues and being able to quantify them through sharing data seems to be crucial for moving forwards. Um, so, and I have a question here from um, Shona McKechnie um, that I'd like to share with you and get both of your comments on, um, who's a qualified psychologist attending the meeting. Can you, um, and this is broadly across obviously crew and um, security, uh, personnel prioritise the various mental health issues being discussed and the ones in that, in your opinion, are having the most effect in the maritime sector, but may not be necessarily understood by the maritime, by the community at large. 
Um, I don't have enough expertise in research within the maritime sector to be able to answer that question right now, Jonah, but uh, maybe in a year's time when we've conducted some research, then we will be able to do that. Obviously, as an as a academic, I like to interpret data and then provide um, answers on what I know. So I wouldn't like to speculate, um, but as a qualified psychologist, if you're in the maritime sector, then maybe we should do the work together. <laughs> And John, do you have a do you have a comment on that from from your research and the work you've been doing? Um, I well, like Risto, I wouldn't claim any competence into the field of psychology. My background was a mariner and then as a sh career ship manager prior to joining the the insurance sector. So I, I'm going to give you just a a, a mariner's perspective. I'm quite certain that um, uh, isolation and anxiety arising from isolation. Uh, will be a major concern i'm sure um as i said earlier on those mariners who then have to uh, expose themselves to to the dangers of trading on, on vessels or working on vessels that are trading into piracy risk areas will be even more exposed to, to anxieties that are that we're talking about so all i could say is that um in answer, a very, very glib and very poor answer to Sean's question, uh, I suppose the isolation, the anxieties arising from those kinds of situations will be the primary concern of, of uh, ship managers and, uh, and, and uh, crew managers of personnel. And that's who probably the, the mariners themselves would probably have to take a, a keen interest in in the future. But going back also to Risto's comment there that um, there'll be a lot of people at sea now who probably will be suffering and um, perhaps unknowingly um, uh, and, and likely to have flashbacks in the style of, of what Risto described mm -hmm. eloquently and um, that it will be a great concern as well to the industry and, and uh, certainly to marine insurers as well if, if indeed many of these mariners who do eventually get home and uh, after their extended periods of board ships and return to, to the same working conditions and be faced with the same challenges as perhaps they are doing now. So it is a very interesting area of, of uh, that deserves uh, further investigation. This issue you've raised, this though, that you've just commented on, John, about you know hidden and unknown triggers um, in terms of the context of this conference, security would seem to me to pose a significant risk to security and safety on board uh, aside from the well-being of the of the seafarers uh, and be kind of a little bit like an iceberg a sort of a hidden danger that's lurking but no one fully understands at the moment and again with little precious little data we had one example exactly of that on a building site where it was one of the security guards who was who was suffering major mental health issues um, as a result of of his ptsd he ran a mock and caused about a hundred thousand pounds worth of damage on the building site and was as a result of his own actions and he was there to protect others and so if you have armed security on board and they start running a mock obviously these these well i'm not speculating that it's going to happen but there are parallels from the land-based security so there is a potential for on on board as well indeed keeping an eye on sorry john do you carry on <laughs> Well, I would just indulge in, in that as well. The, the presence of an armed guard on board a vessel, a commercial vessel, um, is a very alarming and very visible, you know, uh, acknowledgement of the danger the vessel is in and to the crew. But then, uh, you know, if, if, if indeed there is a, even a remote risk that somebody goes rogue on board a vessel and in possession of, of a rifle, uh, then, then it's not uh, too much of a leap of imagination to, uh, to, to understand what might happen. So it is an area of concern for sure. I can see our time, gentlemen, we're counting down. Um... But just turning back to Risco and to the aspect of, of crew and the mental well-being of crew, you mentioned in your presentation, Risco, that um, employers um, have not been in, as engaged with the mental health issue as other stakeholders. So the question to you and to John is, what can the industry do? What can all the stakeholders do to uh, improve employer engagement with such a crucial issue? Well, that's the six million dollar question, isn't it? Um, in the 1990s, I worked at Lloyd's of London, and I think I think my boss, my former boss, Jonathan Jones, may be uh, listening in on the conference. 
as Harlem Machinery underwriters and latterly um, underwriting protected indemnity for two years, potentially we had a lot of power over the ship owners in, in order to change their behavior. I'm, I'm shocked to see that some, some crews um, some officers on board ships operate on six hours on six hours off at the moment which is absolutely insane because they don't get enough rest and then through the fatigue we have additional accidents i would like to see the insurance industry which has responsibility actually to force through some of these measures but the trouble is the insurance industry doesn't really care they are and jonathan won't like me saying this they are too competitive <laughs> and too fragmented actually all of them to get together with class, with flag, actually to try to elicit change. I was listening to the second of the four wreath lectures, which is the BBC's wreath lectures, which which um, Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, he gave um, this morning on, on Radio 4. And he said that after the financial crisis, we all had, a, a, in the financial sector, we had a responsibility to, re, to give credibility back to social capital. And they've done this partly through um, initiatives from regulators, but also forcing private managers to have more responsibility for their own operations. And so if we look at the financial crisis with a comparison with, with COVID-19, this crisis which is hitting all of us, when it comes to coming through the crisis and looking at the impact of seafarers on seafarers because of the crisis, the ability to inability to get home, and now because of the misplacement of all the tens of thousands of empty containers around the world, Vessels are now being redirected away from different container terminals because they can't get in because of the problems of congestion, which gives even more concern to, to, to the seafarers. I think the industry could take more responsibility in looking after their crews, particularly from their perspectives of mental health and well-being. And it could be the insurance industry which takes the lead on this. John, with just a couple of minutes left, can you uh, give us the words, the final words from you? Well, I, I, indeed, I would love uh, to have the, the kind of omnipotence that, that Risto attributes to the insurance industry. I, I, uh, I, I admire and, uh, your, 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 your comment, uh, uh, Risto, but no, I have to disagree that uh, we don't necessarily have the, the clout and influence over to, to affect the kind of change that you're asking for. What we do uh, strive to do is promote best practice. We, at best, I think, have the ability to nudge the people that we insure, the assurance and the members of the clubs in our in, in the PI sector um, to do the right thing in the right direction. But I don't think that we have the kind of regulatory, well, in fact, I'm quite sure we don't have the regulatory uh, type power over, over the um, uh, ship owners and ship managers and crew managers to make the kind of change that you're you're uh, requiring. Um, that said, you know we acknowledge that there are areas certainly where improvements can be made towards the management of crew. Um, the crew, as we all know, and certainly in the standard PNI, they are crucial to the safe operation of vessels. Absolutely, fundamentally, and any support that can be rendered to them and any encouragement that can be rendered to their employers is something that everybody has a responsibility to, to extend. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We're in our final minute. We've scratched the surface of some huge issues, uh, more data, more collaboration, perhaps CSO Alliance may be able to get involved in uh, bringing together some of the people and the way we've both, we've all talked about and Risto, you've talked about. So we are coming up to our final minute. Uh, thank you again. Um, this session could have been much longer and I'll look forward to getting involved in the future uh, when we come back to the debate. So don't forget, look on the event platform, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention, uh, for the links that we so mentioned, and please do put in any further questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.